could you just talk a little bit about how what you're doing is sort of a, is different than OTA or the same, just for a sure. kind of understanding that? Yeah. So we, we are doing tech assessment. The sameness is our, the mission is, is the key issue on, on doing tech assessments. And uh, I think uh, like OTA, we like to have a strong premium on, uh, you know, nonpartisan and fact-based type analysis done by uh, folks who understand the policy arena. And uh, we have technical skills of, you know, engineers of various stripes, as well as scientists, social scientists, uh, economists, we have uh, legal scholars and things. And then we have access to, through a network um, uh, of really, uh, you know, a powerful network capability to be able to reach out and find find folks to, to get those. So in that way, there's a lot of similarities. A lot of the exact expressions of the OTA process are not exactly the same. Uh, we would say that we learn lessons from the OTA and, and we're trying to, again, modernize or update them. Not that any of them were necessarily bad. Uh, if truth be told, there was never really a manual about how you do tech assessment left by OTA that didn't have draft on it, right? It was There were some views, to, even within OTA, there were different views and camps about what TA was, what the role is, should TA be tactical, very near term, or should it be always strategic and take two years and so on. So uh, those are the kind of things that we, we've we created a menu that sort of doesn't have to have that fight um, out of OTA, which we're starting to, to, to be different about, but we also wrote down uh, a manual about how to do tech assessment. And we did this in coordination with the global community, as well as domestic experts, as well as ex-OTAers. And we still have an ongoing uh, standing relationship with a lot of folks giving us a lot of wisdom and insight. So uh, I would say what we're doing is, is very similar in that regard, focusing on policy options, not on policy recommendations, because it's a future leaning thing. We're not saying, here's what you should do, Congress. We're saying, here's what you could do on that and then whatever they're going to do is what they were elected to do and, and to lead and so on and so that way it's all i think we're, we're doing good work so i think that the other thing that we're doing is um that's different is uh, we have our innovation lab that does the analytics and is uh again we can speak to technology as well as use the technology and that i think is really helping us particularly in the digital services arena and things like that when the future shocks of, of 5G, of AI, machine learning systems, uh, of, of analytics and so on, it is going to continue to disrupt the way Congress operates for good or bad. We have to figure out how to, again, maximize the upsides to improve uh, and support better congressional operations or more resilient, I would say, and, and minimize any downsides where, you know, like the insecurities or the the continuity of operations issues or any of those, those particular things. So our lab is designed to help with evidence-based policymaking and yet having a sandbox environment for prototyping technologies, kicking the tires on them, de-risking them, and then uh, supporting their deployment if some operational entity within GAO or maybe even the Congress uh, needed that. Interesting. Yeah, I think, well, let, let me follow up on that in a minute. The first thing I wanna ask, uh, I guess, about what you just said is the expertise side. And this is a, an ongoing kind of thought experiment on what, what's the role of expertise in Congress and how do you access it? You know, do you, do you hire it or do you use a network to access it at universities or somewhere else? So you mentioned you've got more than 100 uh, team members on this. And uh, right. how do you decide which experts to have in-house and which ones to access sure. through a network? And how do you even execute that, you know, that network kind of access? Yeah. Yeah, great question. It's, it's, a, it's really the simple answer is, is all of the above. We do need to have in-house and, and, and that's good because I, I am the same way. When we hire our folks from the outside with PhDs and, and the various disciplines and so on, we have to teach them how to speak Congress, how to engage with Congress, how you brief Congress. It's very different briefing or having a testimony, let's say, this is like the ultimate thing. GAO has a, an institutional metric about how many testimonies do we give? And that's a big deal because that is your state committees in action and, and so on. So, so we like that and we do do that a significant amount in any given year. Um, but to, 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 you know, as you know, Matthew, I was not trained when I was doing my uh, PhD work on how to speak Congress or how to testify before 
Congress or how to write for Congress or communicate this. And, and you take something really high uh, physics, technical kind of thing like quantum computing and explain that. Like, how do you explain a qubit? And, uh, you know, the Schrodinger uh, uh, equation or something, you know, you're not, you're, not tr you're trying to say, I don't want to have any equations. I just want to say, here's what this is, what this means. Uh, what's going on and how this is going to affect the United States in the future. So that's that's what we do for in-house. Externally, as you said, we do want to connect with networks. We have a, a standing uh, relationship with the, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, we're very proud to be, you know, there's an ongoing uh, relationship with them. So that's one way we get expertise. And on every tech study we do, we have an external group that's customized or bespoke uh, are in and around that topic. And it's not just people with PhDs in some very um, uh, advanced area of research, it's that, but plus policy experts that may be working in it for a while, uh, nonprofit think tanks who, who work in certain areas. Uh, we like to have a nice cross-sectoral interdisciplinary uh, discussion on these things. And because our work in this area starts with technology. And then we are building slowly, but surely we have relationships with uh, uh, academia and, and building, uh, we need to have, uh, again, our ideal is like, again, those the students that can be policy, they speak policy and science or engineering at the same time. And so there are a few schools, not many, but a few schools that, that do that rather well. And we, we try and have that relationship there. Um, one of the problems I've said to, I have a friend who is at one of the major land grant, you know, Morrell Act universities. That's a you know, major, major school, thousands of uh, students, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of students, uh, probably a thousand faculty. And uh, I was just asking, asking their person, who do I call when I wanna have a, a question about this? Because, one of the hardest things to do is even on campus just to know what's going on in any given department and so on. So we're working on that to try and identify those folks and those who could speak uh, in, through us to Congress or uh, at least uh, be able to convey some key answers to questions. Um, so that's that's what we do. So your internal people are, are really specialized uh, in this kind of translation exercise and yes. seeking out the external experts uh, where, where you don't have it internally. Yes, to augment the, the folks that we have who, who are taught how to write for and, and do and have evidence. You know, we geo quality standards are very high. Uh, again, we're fact-based. So if it's not a factual thing, then we don't want to, we don't deal in opinions. We will present um, uh, when we convene experts and ask them to render various opinions, we'll present that. So we'll let we'll uh, make sure that we're scribing and saying this is what uh, such and so expert group is telling us. So that uh, some of those things there, but we'll identify that as you know ascribe it to the proper uh, role or individual or what have you, and it allows us to to be able to maintain our uh, independence and, and nonpartisanship, and allows us to be you know uh, very clear about what things are getting, what are factual things, and what are or things that a group has a view of that you know, we're passing along. However, consider the other side because there's there's other there's always an, an, another side to various stories. So maybe I'll change gears a little bit and ask you a question about um, Congress as an institution, right? Sure. Getting outside of the the GAO uh, and your particular group and think about Congress as its own system, right? You're you're a systems right. you're a systems guy. You're thinking yep. about all the interconnected pieces in the future and assumptions and models. Um, and as someone who's really, you know, um, deep into that kind of way of thinking, when you look at Congress today as a system that's evolved since the founding, say, mm -hmm. right. you know, what kind of processes or procedures or organizational structures do you see that you think you know, are not working or that could be improved or others that are working great? You know, what is your opinion when you look at Congress as an institution and think as a, think as a founder about how you might reform it to make it more effective at, as, as an institution? Yeah, no, thanks. So uh, yes, so a lot of my job is really to help Congress in an institutional way. So to reflect GAO and what we do to really help Congress succeed in performing its article one duties and responsibilities under the, under the Constitution. 
I think from a top level, I mentioned the, the, the R word just a little while ago, but I think resilience is a key thing. I think, um, you know, this isn't about changing Congress per se. And I, I don't think, you know, uh, the fundamentals of Congress need changing in the sense of what they're supposed to do according to the constitution. That's not at hand. The issue is how do they do it in an era where as we all just had this massive global shock of a pandemic where, uh, you know, a 18th and 19th century U.S. institution was predicated upon in-person operations. And there's good reasons for that. It's very important to have that meet and greet, to have the, the coffee on the side or the shake, the deal making, the handshaking, the, the, those sort of personal interactions that were largely prohibited in the, in the pandemic. So, but how do we create in, in, in this era where we have members that typically are, you know, jumping on airplanes every weekend, having to go back because you've got to serve the constituency and do your job. It's a very difficult job. Um, I, I'm just thinking, how do we support their operations, make it more uh, resilient? And by we, I don't mean just my team or, or GAO. I'm just saying, thinking through as an American, uh, how do we have it uh, to have more of that uh, that R word, the, the resilience on that. So that's one area of thinking through in a resilient way, right? Nobody anticipated the uh, assault on the Capitol on January 6th, and that's a resilience question. And you know, you saw that what happened is our lawmakers refused to to just stop all activity. They still ultimately convened. They voted. Uh, the election was certified, and it moved on. So um, that happened in one way that was resilient. But how do we? think through in, in that particular way. So that's one area. Uh, obviously, from a technology perspective, I'm a technology person. Look, we, we want to, um, I, I'll, I'll use a, a concept that's used in data analytics that I really like, but I think it's, it definitely applies to, to lawmaking and, and doing this. Um, in data analytics circles, there's something called the DIKW pyramid, okay? And all it means is it's an acronym, but the base, like if you think of a pyramid and the large base of it is a D, uh, that stands for data, right? You, you're gonna have a lot of data in the world. This is where, again, Congress gets lots of stuff thrown at it. We'll just call it data for right now. But the next value layer up from that, that's, that, that it comes out of data, it becomes information. And so they do need to have information. They need to have basic facts. They need to have uh, measurements or metrics or anything told to them so that it's a zero oversight. Well, how much was spent? Was that more than they should have spent? Was it this or that? Are there reasons why? So there's that kind of information that yields from the data to do that. And that's gonna come from federal agencies that they oversee, but also it's gonna come from the outside of interest groups or things like that. So then the next layer up becomes the K is, is knowledge. And so now we really are converting information to knowledge and how do they really know? And that implies building an institutional capacity and memory or understanding of the issues. Because as you say, I am a, a systems guy, I think you are too, is when you think about things in a system sense, it's more than just a, a narrow individual member optic or even sometimes, as I've mentioned before, just a committee optic as much as committees can only do what they can do. So. Uh, so I think the, the knowledge yield is, is very important. And then ultimately at the, the pinnacle though, to get to is the W is the wisdom. And so I think our job is to do that. How do we enable through technology? It's not about the technology, right? I could say cloud IT, I could say 5G, I could say AI, all the sort of the shiny sounding and cool sounding things. They are cool, they're transformative, they're, they're coming, they're real. Uh, but getting out of all the marketing, I'm just saying, how do I help uh, members get from the data layer all the way to the wisdom layer in as efficient a manner as possible uh, and to have tools and technologies available to them to help get to that W so that at some point they're going to vote yay or nay or abstain or what have you. They're going to represent their district as their or state as their they have been elected to do. And, and that's the way it's that's the way lawmaking is and move forward. It can be messy and so on, but it need not be clunky with uh, outdated technology in an era where, for example, Google's a verb now. So what can we do thinking in that sort of terms in an agile framework, I think is, is, is important. And so I'll, the last thing I'll just say is agility. I mentioned that there's a culture of just how do we wash, rinse, repeat or go through, or can we, can we have laboratories or things like that of thinking or policy that could be 
uh, you know, uh, just thought experiments only. It could be testing of various things before you actually enact or, or what have you. I think there's, there might be ways to try and help them again, build an epistemology that's so, that they are gonna vote on. Uh, and again, there's still gonna be them. There's no changing fundamentally on anything I've said. It's just how to enable them to do their job more or better. Well, it's interesting, the way you just described that vision uh, up to wisdom is really almost sounds like an individual member process, right? Each member sure. can get the data, the information, you know, knowledge, and then the wisdom. It's really, you're, tr you're trying to, at least the way that that was framed seemed to me a very kind of member, individual member focused kind of view, which I think is great. On the other hand, I wonder about, because Congress is a process driven institution as well. Exactly. Right. And there are rules that and, and information and bills go through stages, you know, step by step and there's votes and then there's this or that. When you look at those kinds of parts of the process, you know, the rules, the, the mm -hmm. sequence of events, mm -hmm. uh, the thresholds, you know, these types of rules in Congress mm -hmm. as a systems guide, do you ever look at any of these rules and think, you know, these ones don't make any sense. They're bad system design or if they just tweaked it this way, maybe you know it would be a better outcome, regardless of the information flow, right? Just in terms of the process, step by step. Uh, do you have any perspective on that? Sure. So I, you know, first of all, I'm not an expert on all the rules of the myriad of the House or Senate rules. So I, I I'm not going to speak in any particular way. It's not my role in any way. Uh, what I will say is, again, just I'm speaking now as an engineer, like a process engineer. It is like, how do you convert? an idea into law, and that does go through kind of a machine of sorts, uh, I'll just say, uh, uh, some of which you, you may not actually want to witness, but nonetheless, it's, <laughs> it is what it is. So the engineer in me always is to say, well, just how does it work? And absolutely, I've seen inefficiencies in, in doing things. And I think, um, Matthew, part of it is, is, is what is the desired, desired outcome? Because I can think like an engineer and say, this should be more efficient. But a lot of the founders design through ex express to the constitution is to be deliberative to not to necessarily be, you know, where, where time isn't rushing something through is a bad or the appearance of rushing something through is a bad idea. So, um, I, you know, I think it's a, it's an interesting, what is the desired outcome that you, well, you're want. optimizing and, for that W, right? I mean, yes, I am. I am. Wisdom. Right, right. But, but sometimes, you know, the, uh, uh, how would we get like, a, there's, there's members on the Hill that have been there to AIDS and there's members who, are, you know, are just several months old kind of thing. And so uh, the several months old member is going to, again, to need to have a steep ability to come up on the learning curve. And so it's a different, um, getting to the W for them is different in a certain way from an institutional perspective than the, than the longtime member. However, that said, if you start saying, well, 5G is coming, let's say some big disruptive technology, well, there might be an equal learning curve on that. And we do have to solve, as you say, how do you get to the W on, on, on those things for them as a member and as a committee? And, and I, I, I take your point about the, a lot of what I'm saying is about, um, or, or sounds like it's member centered. I think that's, that's well said. I do think it could apply to you know, committees and, and Congress as a whole, where you have a, a body who has knowledge on things and there's a sharing. It's supposed to interact that way. It's, it's not meant to be uh, centers or concentrations of power where just one person's making a decision. That's, you know, that would be undemocratic, right? So, so uh, in any case, I think given the, the, the um, parameters, the design variables, we, we assume that if we can solve the DIKW, get the data to the W, in a contextually relevant way, but as a body, as well as the member, I think that's that's a desirable thing. All right, well, I think it's time for us to move on to our, our we call our lightning round, our common questions we ask everybody who comes on the program. So if you're ready, sure. we'll move on to those. Absolutely, I love where lightning rounds are fun, so. All right, so the first one is, what do you think congressional representation should mean? Okay, so I think, what that means is um, faithful representation of uh, as or inclusive rec representation of as many of your constituents as possible at the rate of, of legislation or ideas and communication and information of the 21st century. 
So it means a, a representative should seek to represent the whole district, all the different individuals within it, not just their own, you know, either narrow majority or what have you. That's usually the design of the system. I know there's a majority minority and, and things. I, I will say, I, in my experience, I've, I've had the privilege of getting to know several members, really learning about what the life of a member, I really have a lot of respect. It's a very difficult job. So that's where part of the the, the, the honor of trying to serve them and, and, and get them to do that because these are, at the end of the day, still Americans, they're people. And uh, so human, dehumanizing them is a bad idea. I think we need to always remember the human side of things. And, um, but I know that uh, ideally that they represent as, as much of their district as they can. And when they represent, is it they represent their beliefs uh, or is it that the member is exercising uh, his or her judgment about the best interests of that group? I think it's a both. I, I think you the the there are times where one of one of your categories might outweigh the other in terms of a weighting factor in some given thing, um, and that's often what makes I think political activity so interesting because sometimes you might have a sense of a, a bigger broader picture, but if you vote a certain way, it, it would definitely uh, diminish your your standing with your constituents who voted you to to uh, ideally to vote a, a different way. So, uh, but I think in each, each decision, uh, again, I'm not speaking from experience. I have no direct inside knowledge of everything, but it seems to me that it's, it's a mixture of those th things and the ratios, I think, of any given thing is, is the question. And how about the future uh, constituents of a district as opposed to the current ones? Yeah, I, I think it's all, I think sustainability and resilience in long term, I think voting uh, or, or doing lawmaking too much in the now is um, it, it becomes a massive opportunity cost against looking at those things that are coming and trying to shape a better future for those that are coming up, even if they're not voting folks. So, right, so if you're under 18, do you really have a say, even though you're being represented in one way? Uh, do I think um, the institution should, should have its activities looking toward that sort of long-term sustainability? I think, yes, I think GAO and its work formally has, has always done that. And Matthew, honestly, I mentioned our foresight work. I think our every bill that goes in has some element of foresight to it. It's how, how much of it, right? Because they are the bill is trying to shape something and saying the the future I would like to shape is this because of that. Uh, and so I think we just need to remember that it's not always a reactive thing. That there's times where we're looking at the future, and I think in looking at the future, I think those non-voting members of your district are, are represented in that way and ought to. Okay. Right. Uh, next one is, and you've already alluded to something around this area, but how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think you have to, you're elected to represent your constituency. So uh, there's a major, uh, um, a, 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 a significant fraction of your time has to be to constituent services for sure. Uh, what's the percentage of that? Is it 50% or greater, um, maybe it's 51%. Then there's the issues that you're, because you're going to be on committees and you're going to be assigned to various things and you have to be in caucuses or you're in parties or what have you, you have to serve that. So I think ideally it's constituents, uh, constituent services plus um, uh, the working on the issues and, and coming up to the W if you don't already have that or at least sharing the W if you do. Are becoming more W because the things things have been changing so rapidly, then I think uh, that's that's an ideal situation. Yeah. And so, what about oversight uh, compared to say the legislative aspect or the issues aspect, or do you conceive of those things as the same thing? Uh, I see those as, as the same thing. I, I think you know good oversight has a now and not yet, in my opinion, uh, dimension to it because there are things to deal with now, but you're also again in a foresight context. How, how do you shape the future that, that, that we desire that's as, you know, e pluribus unum as possible and as sustainable as possible, as resilient as possible. And um, that's a hard thing to do because there are so many competing interests that, that, we, that we see and have to work in and, and we, we support our members in that, but that is, I think, the idea. And how about their time in DC versus time at the home district? 
I think, uh, and again, an, an easy answer is just the equal, equal parts. I think you can't be in DC too long. I think of, if I understand right, uh, some members have not been reelected because they were perceived as being in DC too long, right? Uh, so it, it feels like one of those no good deed goes unpunished if you're, if you're there and you're building the W because you're in and around things. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so I, I think it's an equal parts thing. I think you do have to have that constituency um, engagement because you're elected, to, you know, the people are the government who have asked you to represent them. And if you're hitting that, that key metric of representation of as many and inclusion as much as, much as possible as your district, then you have to know your district and, and continue to know it and spend time in it. So. All right. It's easy next. to say, but hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. So again, very. All right. ne next question is: uh, How should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? Um, I think uh, I don't have a, a, a quick answer to that, other than to say, uh, focusing on how we might enable the tools of the 21st century to help support debate and 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 discussion. I think is there. I have participated in something I thought was, was great. I, I didn't see this until I was invited to do one, um, but members will do round tables, uh, which is different than a hearing uh, in a round table. Uh, they can get together in a bipartisan way and you just have a discussion. It's like, you know, I don't wanna trivialize it. It's very important, but it, it gives them, it's more of a discussion format. It's not in an open in five minutes and, and this and that, it has, has experts there. Uh, the bipartisan leadership of whatever the committee is just trying to flesh out the issues. I'm a fan of that because uh, I don't know how much or, or what the right, I'm not gonna render an opinion on what that means in terms of the whatever the right amount. I just know that goodness is done when you have an environment to be able to, for them to ask questions of those things, discuss the issues. Uh, and members know their issues. They're very sharp on these things and so, I've enjoyed learning from them with, through the questions they're asking or and trying to help them out. So I am a fan of that, the extent to which the Congress could do more of that in addition to all that it's doing with respect to uh, floor speeches or hearings or things like that. Um, that's one thing I would recommend just through experience. Was the round table um, a transparent element where it was videotaped or was it more of a closed door discussion? Well, it was it was closed door because it wasn't an official record in the sense that uh, you know it wasn't meant to be anti transparency. It was just meant to be the format to be pro um, uh, discussion or, or a more intimate setting, a less less formalized. So you have at least a middle ground, which doesn't do away with uh, all the transparency that are needed in various things. So transparency is important. I mean, to my agency, accountability is the middle name. So we, we, and we have a bias we, toward uh, publishing our reports. We put them out, um, uh, the vast majority of them, and you can, you can go to geo.gov and see the vast array of work that we do and have that. So it's not an anti-transparency, it's just a pro having an occasional environment just to talk through something. I'll say that without all the, the cameras on. And I think there's value in that, so. Great. All right. Well, the next question is, uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Uh, so I think um, within that time frame, I think uh, the idea of, uh, again, not fundamentally changing itself, but I mean, the, the fundamentals of Congress, but how the fundamentals are supported or enabled through um, uh, digital technologies that are made secure and they, they can have they, their they're given an environment where they can get up to from the D to the W rapidly. I think uh, a systems and an architecture that sort of has that way of thinking that supports an agile kind of approach to uh, problem solving is, is what's needed. Um, it just to, again, not changing anything fundamentally just to, but to try and iron out some of the kinks where uh, there's, as the, the modernization on, on, on uh, Congress committee, the select committee issued uh, the first uh, round of that issued a report talking about the need for just offices to talk to one another. But so um, I think uh, having uh, technologies for communication that support uh, deliberation, uh, good debate, 
in a transparent way when it, you need transparency for sure, um, but also have those environments where you can you can share things. I think is um, is the way to go. Great. Next one is uh, what book or article most shape your thinking with respect to congressional reform, or I could just say Congress itself. <laughs> I just point to, yeah, thanks. I think a really, a, one that was very well done, it did mention, of course, you mentioned OTA, Matthew, and it did mention that, but it was, it was the uh, select committees, uh, the modernization committee's report. It had, I thought it was a honest introspective look at itself. And it was well done with respect to engaging with a lot of members directly in a bipartisan way, just trying to problem solve. So I just point to that. I think that is the authoritative you're having Congress talk about itself on what it, it, it's, it was a committee tasked with doing this. And I think so many of the things there are, are speaking to a lot of the issues toward good, sustainable, resilient, transparent, uh, effective uh, government uh, from the first branch uh, in that report. So my favorite report is actually their report. Excellent. So the last question is more about just your plans for the future with the organization and, uh, you know, what kind of developments you have on the horizon and, you know, what are your plans? Sure. So everything I was saying, uh, what we're really trying to do, GAO is a, uh, is a leading institution and, and is, is, wants to be world-class and is world-class in terms of oversight and, and, and those sort of things. Um, uh, it also wants to continually improve. And so I think the working through GAO and working in, in the way we're doing in our innovation lab, how to convert that D to the W, uh, using the tools in the state of the art to try and change the clock speed of how we could help support Congress and therefore help Congress come up to speed by, well, you know, we're not trying to prod Congress, we're just trying to give them or serve them as they're, they are our clients. And our job is to get them to succeed and in their deliberation and processes. And I think using the technology and innovating that space to do that is uh, a key passion of ours now. So we can both uh, prototype the technologies, report on those, say what's good and, and what's challenging, what may work for this or not that, um, but then also you know give them the heads up to do that topical reconnaissance on key technologies and key trends that will, that are, and will continue to affect them. That's gonna be our good work and our vision for the future. Any, any particular uh, uh, of these prototypes or projects that you could you know, give us some insights on? Like what, what kind of things are you developing there? Sure, so I'll, I'll give you, uh, one is a, a big thing still to come, but um, meaning uh, we've been speaking to uh, Matthew, the improper payments problem for a number of years. So we have a financial management and assurance team that's worked for decades in this. And improper payments means things that are often erroneous or some manual process or paperwork results in things where the government is spending twice on the same thing or, or three times. Or uh, the Comptroller General had a testimony last year where he was talking about the CARES Act. We were rapidly IRS was just getting money out. And of course, what happens is they're paying a lot of, they're sending a lot of checks to people who had been deceased. And so, right, that's an improper payment. So using today's data and state of the art, how do we more proactively uh, work on that and, and really focus on what's called payment integrity or that, that dimension of the problem? So uh, I have the privilege of having uh, in, in my team, GAO's chief data scientist. He, he, he also directs our lab. Uh, Innovation Lab, his name's Taka Riga, and Taka is leading that effort uh, jointly with our financial management team to work and, and figure out and even um, work under a joint, uh, in, in a joint way or in a, in a safe way uh, with uh, the executive branch entities because they're the ones processing the payments and we're the auditing of the financial system. So we're trying to have a way where the Innovation Lab can uh, compute and test those sort of things and try and work on payment integrities in partnership with uh, those folks that are financial auditors over here would, would and, and can and still need to audit. So it's a nice way of problem solving on a key problem that's really a trillion dollar size uh, problem when you look at a decade. That's one there. The now I'd say is um, what Taka's team has done is they've been able to ingest all of GAO's um, body of reports since 2013, and they've been able to make it where it's a content-centered 
pull on that information instead of just doing a return on a search engine that re returns a whole report. What it's starting to do is extract out that content and putting it in such a way so that if a member wants to ask a question of the entire corpus of GAO's body of work in a, in a relatively narrow way, it'll get content instead of just a, a, a list of reports that could be 50, 70, 100 pages long that they're not gonna read on that. They wanna know, what are you saying about this? And then you would pull that content out. It, you'd have to do some analysis on that, but it's a much more rapid cycle time where we're trying to get to that wisdom for them in a matter of if it was years before we want to go to months or months to weeks or weeks to days or days out um, and so just bringing things down decrementing by at least an order of magnitude to meet that cycle time and still you know we're not inventing any new GAO uh, content we're just trying to repackage content in a way and get it to them very quickly in a way that will surprise them. Excellent. Well, look, really looking forward to those. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time, your service, and, uh, you know, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Sure. Thanks very much, Matthew. It's a pleasure. I uh, enjoyed talking with you today.